mention the name of a river and people immediately create for themselves the oddest mental pictures. Take the river Tyne. What sort of a picture does that suggest to most people? Perhaps this. Or this. Or this. And what of the tweed? These are perhaps the pictures which, for most, mention of the tweed brings to mind. Now, the county of Northumberland lies largely between these two rivers, the Tyne and the Tweed. For the majority of people living outside the Northeast, the impression they associate with industrial Tyneside are the ones they associate with Northumberland. And the strange thing is that only one tenth of the county is industrialized. This part. Nine tenths of Northumberland are rural and are therefore more faithfully portrayed by the popular pastoral Im images of the Tweed. Perhaps not surprising that such a widespread misconception exists. The lead which Northumberland's sons have given the world in so many industrial fields could account for it. The work of George Stevenson, Northumbrian and pioneer of railways is known the world over. So too are the heavy engineering products of the firm founded by the first Lord Armstrong. And fine shipping has been associated with the Tyne for many generations. It's not industry with which this film is concerned, however, but rather Northumberland's landscape. The beauty of England's most northerly county has been recognized by the creation of a national park. 400 square miles selected to give the greatest variety of seeds precipitous crags and stretches of moorland, wooded valleys and echoing hills, ensure for the visitor a continually changing scene, delighting his eye, stirring his imagination, and reviving his spirit of adventure. Flora and fauna attract the naturalist. Streams and lakes challenge the angler. And distant views entice the walker and the cyclist, just as they entice the motorist, and call them on to top the next rise or to see what lies round the next bend in the road. It's hard to think of any open-air pastime or pleasure which cannot be enjoyed within or on the very doorstep of the National Park. The northernmost part of the park embraces the heart of the Cheviot country, an area where grass-clad hills sweep down to friendly, stream-sweetened valleys. No lack of variety here. One valley differs from the next as certainly as the pebbles in their streams. Particularly lovely is the valley of the College Burn. Rising at the hen hole, the College Burn skirts the foot of Cheviot itself. Until joined by the Lambden Burn, it carves a broader course and flows out of the National Park near the tiny village of Kirk Newton. Most of these villages of rural Northumberland have some treasure to interest the visitor. And Kirk Newton is no exception, for inside its 13th century church is to be found a unique piece of sculpture the Adoration of the Magi, in which the wise men are depicted wearing kilts. The name of the sculptor is unknown, but it's believed to be of local workmanship dating back to the 12th century. The chancel is a fine example of northern medieval architecture, its vaulting seeming to grow out of the very ground itself. A move south and eastward now to follow the slopes of steeply curving hills aptly named Bells. Many of these, of which Yeavering Bell is perhaps the best known, bear traces of ancient British camps, strategically sited to crown the hills and reign over the valleys in between.
Today, sheep graze where once primitive man hunted and fought. Sheep with their valuable fleeces have always been important to Wooler, one of Northumberland's northernmost market towns. In addition to being the principal market centre for a large area, Wooler is also the main jumping off point for visitors to this lovely part of the county. With Cheviot at the centre, the boundary of the National Park describes a wide southward sweeping arc to include the valley of the Harthope Burn, the delight of summer walkers seeking the heights of Hedgehope Hill, Cheviot's nearest rival, and in winter, the pathway to thrills for the skier. southward again to the River Bremish. West of Ingram, and here little more than a burn, the River Bremish meanders through the park along its flat and narrow valley, hemmed in by characteristic Cheviot slopes, green here, scree-scarred there. To strike deeper into the National Park, the visitor must go on foot by smugglers' paths towards the Scottish border. The past is remembered today by the wild, romantic names of landmarks, Cushard Law and Bloody Bush Edge, to mention only two. Now the streams flow south and east off the Cheviot slopes to swell that well-known Northumberland River, the Cocot, rising near Chew Green, the site of a once important Roman camp. The Cocot tumbles down its long, narrow valley by the hamlets of Blindburn, Windyhoff, Shilmoor, Lynn Shields and Alwinton. Alwinton, once the point of departure for smugglers on stealthy journeys into the hills, and only eight miles to the Scottish border. Down the valley again to Harbottle, a pleasant single street village of flower-fronted houses. Harbottle, a village once overshadowed by its castle, long since all but vanished. No excursion into this historic countryside is complete without a visit to Holystone and its ancient well, in which Paulinus is said to have baptized some thousands of converts to Christianity. The River Cocot lends it to the National Park now for only a further three or four miles before flowing away to Rothbury. Rothbury. Leafy Rothbury. Rothbury, the meeting place for anglers who seek the trout and salmon fishing for which the Cocot is so widely known. 